all for one family on stage. Their first gig, The Cars. It didn't go in that we could actually be meeting our producer or that this could be a major record year for us. If you feel the emotion in every song, you give across the emotion of the song. You have been a wonderful audience and we will remember this. We will be back. When you're put in a situation where you have to perform, where you have to deliver, no matter what, if something happens. That's why we're doing it. We're doing it because we love it. Hi, my name is Simon Franklin. I was the programmer on Forgiven Not Forgotten. You're listening to Causecast. Hi, and welcome to episode three of Causecast. In this episode, we speak with award-winning record producer and composer Simon Franklin. Simon is best known for working with some of the industry's top names, such as Tony Braxton, Eric Clapton, Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson, Celine Dion, and his later work for scoring films such as the James Bond films Skyfall and Spectre. His work on the first Avatar film led to both Grammy and Golden Globe nominations. A huge thanks goes out to Simon, who took time out from scoring the next two Avatar films to speak with me regarding his time working on Forgiven Not Forgotten with the Cause. Simon was responsible for using the Synclavier and programming that to build the songs into the tracks we now know as the finished album. Please enjoy this incredible insight into what it was like to be in the studio building these tracks with the Cause and David Foster. I began the interview by asking Simon how this all began for him. How did he begin composing music for a living? I guess the first thing I want to talk about is a background to your story. How did you get to the point where you were in a studio with David Foster and the cause and, and doing the programming side? Where did music start for you? Uh, I was always going to do this. Um, at 13, I wrote to the BBC saying, how do I become a record producer and a film composer? Um, so I had no choice. I was unemployable in any other regard. I started in a, after, a, I was in Manchester for the Hacienda days. Um, I was at university there. Then I went to London, which is where I'm born and bred. And I started working in a tiny studio and they got a thing called the PPG Wave, which was a synthesizer sampler at the time. Somebody saw me using it, said, and then told a guy called Trevor Horn about me. Uh, Trevor Horn was a record producer who was uh, big at the time in the, uh, that I was working. And uh, so I then got hired by Trevor to program for him. And that involved things like uh, Yes and Frankie Goes to Hollywood and um, a bit, the other things like so George Michael and Godly and Cream and other things and so on. Um, then I left. I started doing jingles. I started doing producing records on my own. Um, and at some point, uh, an American producer engineer asked if I would program for him, and I didn't. At that time, I was now a producer, so I thought I knew everything. The machine I used at that time was called the Synclavia, which was this enormous music computer. And Synclavia phoned me up and said, please work with this guy. And this guy was an American engineer, a Chilean engineer called Humberto Gatica, who was David Foster's engineer. Humberto looked at me uh, programming and said, you seem to work in a different way to anybody you that I've seen. You should come to L.A. Uh, and I thought about it. And then I shipped all my gear out to L.A. And after a few months, uh, I met David. Uh, and we started working together. And I think um, I came from a alternative. Um, and, you know, in my heart, I'm still a punk. Um, and, and, and David and I hit it off almost immediately. And we started working together. And in the 90s, there was just as a lot of, there was the bodyguard, there was obviously Celine, there was Whitney, you know, so Whitney, um, uh, Tony Braxton, uh, I don't know, dozens of number ones and so on. So uh, we'd been working a lot together. And at the point the cause come into this story is that he and I are in New York because uh, David is producing Michael Jackson. And um, and I'm in New York there, and I was working with David on Michael Jackson and also with Michael on other tracks for the album. At this point, we are working at Hit Factory in New York, beautiful studio, now, now blocks of flats, but then it was a wonderful studio. And um, at some point, uh, Jason Flom brings 
uh, the cause around. Mm. And so if I rightly, it is the entire family, including mother and father mm. uh, and manager. And obviously, you know, um, and um, you'll have to remind me of the manager's name. It'll come to uh, me. John Hughes. John Hughes, of course. Wonderful John Hughes. Yes, John, wonderful. I'm st I apologize, John. I do. I'm <laughs> so sorry. Um, but uh, so the that we're working and they come and they meet us there and they do a little impromptu acoustic thing. At this point, David is trying to create a label for himself, this 143 Records. Yeah. And, um, and Jason has um, he, the, the other, his label within Atlantic as well. And the, it's, it's obvious they're extremely talented. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then from that we get then we then get you know then David says well, you know I want to produce them but not only that I want to do the album which was unusual because most of the time what would happen is we tended to do singles we would tended to do the big song on an album so rarely did we do an entire album and that made it different I heard, you know, I've heard from several people that it was very rare, and it just seems from his back catalogue that that David would get involved with a band for an album. You know, maybe a soloist, something like that. But but an entire doing a band album it isn't very David. Would you agree with that? Uh, entirely. I mean, we didn't. We did no bands. I think in the period, you know, I, I if you that period of what I think some people call the Foster years in the nineties. Um, where he and I used to work constantly together. You know, I was doing other sessions for other people and I was pro producing and doing other stuff for other people, but David and I did a lot of records and um, we had a sort of set thing where he would come over to my studio um, or I would go to his house uh, either way. And we would, we'd spend maybe a couple of days working on a track, uh, programming it up, arranging it. Usually the way that worked would be that David would play a piano part. I would then do all the drums and the rhythm stuff. He, he or I would play a bass. Then we, we would sort of divvy up the other bits and pieces. Sometimes I'd play strings, sometimes he'd some, you know, and so on. And David is ludicrously talented. Um, he, I learned more about record production from him than, than anyone. And his, I, what I loved about him is that uh, his internal chord work. He has this um, spectacular way of using, of building the chord so that there's space for the vocals, and the way that the the um, uh, you know the way that the song flows, getting that sense of song structure. There's a thing that you, you know in the Foster records you always hear. One is that the vocal is all the vocal always wins, yeah. which is really important. And the second thing is that there's always this beautiful natural evolution within the tracks. Um, so we would program for a couple of days, then Michael would come in uh, to do guitars or uh, maybe Dean Parks on acoustic sometimes. Um, and then on day three, day four would be vocals, uh, lead vocals and probably um, uh, section singers would come and do backing vocals as well. And, um, and then on the day five would be pickups on the lead vocal and then it would be sent off to mix and then the next week repeat. Wow. Um, and that was what we did. And so, yes, it was very unusual. Even with the, the Michael Jackson stuff, I did two tracks with David on the Michael Jackson album. No, three, so three, we did three tracks with Michael, but I did some others on that album. It was the history album. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, did it, was it, am I right in saying you did a um, keyboard and percussion and drum programming for those mainly or yes that was it. I mean it was just you know the Synclavia was this thing that I could make any sound it was a sound it was the the big it was the mega sampler of its time so that I got hired to either create entire tracks mm. so if you listen to um you know most of those things if you hear the strings sometimes there would be real strings but a lot of the time it was me and the, Syn the Synclavia um and uh and that was the way, you know, we just, we had a, a process. I had a racks and racks of synthesizers. I, my session rig was two tons wow. of equipment. So it was just literally enormous racks of equipment. 
Um, these days I do it with, you know, Mac Pros. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, so that was it. And we were in New York. Then the next thing happened was we moved back to LA. Uh, you know, we, we finished that chunk of Michael Jackson. And then you know, we convened at um, David's house in the north side of Malibu. Yeah, the studio, and then the family was living there for the the, the process of the the building of the album with their parents. As, as yeah, well, which is amazing. What a great creative little crash that's been yeah. set up for that. So yeah, it's very still very strange to hear that it. You know, David's taken on this band album. It's mad, daunting in a lot of ways. I'm sure thinking trying to get that hit out of every single every single track. It was obvious that they were really talented. The stuff sounded great. Um, and uh, I think that was the thing. It, it was, it felt different. It felt fresh. And um, David was moving into a new house um, and therefore he, the old house that he and Linda had had at the time, or Linda's house, so it was, this was Linda's house at the time, had, was a perfect place for them to stay, for the band to stay. What were your first impressions on on hearing the band? How did you first hear the band? Obviously, were you with David when they came in with their family in New York and played yes. that set to you? Can you remember what songs were played? There was probably one of the traditional ones, I think. And then, uh, and I, I think it might have been Runaway. I had this feeling that Runaway is in there. That sort of, that sort of tickling we were upstairs at Hit Factory. Um, we were in one of the bigger rooms at Hit Factory at the time. Um, and therefore, yeah, there was, there was definitely a piano there. Yeah, that would have been Caroline on piano for Runaway then. Definitely. Yeah, yeah definitely. And that was the first you heard. How long from, from that meeting until you're then, what was the next thing you heard from them? Did you then hear the demo cassettes that had already been produced by Jim and Bill Whelan at that time? I think I might have heard some of that. Um, yeah, usually what would happen is that we'd go in fresh, is that we would have a... Jim had programmed some stuff up on one of the sort of more basic music computers that was available at the time, uh, like an Atari or something like that. Um, and so he brought those pro those things in um he brought the data from that um and then yes we had the cassettes and also we had the band there so it wasn't like you know that was the thing is that what often happened would be that they would just sing the song and then we're going oh yeah now we know that right. one that's how it goes yeah exactly yeah. um and then it was a case of making it into a hit which was the day job yeah, and that was, you know, that was the thing. There's a difference between um, what they were doing and and that polish that makes, you know, makes it a great record. Mm -hmm. And g going from the, the, you know, Jim, Jim and the girls rehearsed in a upstairs bedroom of a property, a, a corner away from their family home, uh, freezing cold. And he did all the programming in that little room. For, for years and then to suddenly be with one of the world's greatest producers side by side developing their their tracks into world-class album is mind-blowing how how it's taken that such huge leap but um it's definitely a testament to, to their skill as artists it's incredible do you have any understanding of obviously there, there's a lot of demo a lot of stuff they were doing at a demo stage choosing the song why, why were certain songs just never worked on well there was a first of all there there are the things you look for the hits yeah all right so so however you know there, there were the first thing was finding the hits i mean that would have been a process between that would have been david that would have been jason that would have been the band and and also you know and it's pretty evident which what you know you there are think there are tracks there that you immediately hear that are great. There were some tracks I'm pretty certain that we started and then decided to discard. Um, Interesting. And there are also those little snippets. There's all the Kel the various Irish Celtic snippets yeah. that are in there. And often what will happen is that that was one of those things where 
there was talk about whether to have bigger, longer things. And this felt like a way of providing connections. And there was a, there was a habit in the records of those times where there were, obvious, there were often these, these interlude tracks between songs. If you listen to a lot of the stuff, for instance, a lot of the stuff that Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis were doing um, and so on, there would often be these chunks. And this in some ways was not dissimilar to that. There's obviously, a, there's a, I've got versions of the album without any of the instrumental tracks. So was that a later decision in, in the album's production to do that weaving of? Yes. Yeah, we were concentrating on the, on the you know, you do the big stones first. You put, you do the, you work on the hits and then you work on the tracks that you think are good because they give a character to the album and then everything else was, these points also, what, what happened with some of those interludes was that the band would record those, some of those were just recorded live in the studio. And so we just did them ad hoc. You know, um, I think if I remember, like Felipe was, in, was doing a lot of the engineering and often what would happen is that there would be, you know, to, we would, there would be times when they just recorded a chunk of that, but it wouldn't be, was then put to one side, you know, because they were very much those live interludes. There was not much that I did on top of those. I mean, little bits and pieces, but the idea was to have that Celtic feeling in there. That raw, which, which yeah. explains a lot, because if you look at the demo tapes and, and their progression, um, and David writes this is mixing, he only mixed those parts, those uh, in, interludes, the instrumental parts. Were they fuller tracks to begin with? Because they're very, they're very short in their fade outs between. No. They're always just small little interludes and then. They were done live in the back room. They weren't, they weren't intended to be anything other than that feeling of the band from Ireland. Wow. It worked. Yeah. <laughs> it really worked. Yeah. Forgive not forgotten. What what can you remember about building that track? So what happened with that, I'm almost certain is that there was an Atari demo there um, that Jim brought in. I then, what would happen is I would basically take his MIDI, but I would, then everything got replaced uh, with, with my sounds. Where did those sounds come from? All the synth, synth clad? Yeah, and, and panks of synthesizers and whatever else. Okay. So, cool. so, so it's, it's not just, but mainly like all the drums are synth clavier, um, all the groove stuff. It had this incredible, um, that it had a particular feel um, and you can hear it across all the tracks I did at the time. It had, it's just, the, the groove is a, a, exquisite. And um, so I, what went, tended to happen is that, although Jim, I think there was a thing with Jim where when we initially started working, there was this thing where Jim needed to sort of like, uh, he suddenly dis discovered there was a palette of sounds that was available. And, you know, and we worked together, it was, it was nice, I, you know, because he'd been so intimately into it. You then have to also say, right, how do we extend this further? Um, and that, but what tended to happen is that then I would be, um, I had a way of programming that was sort of in, in my style. David would be playing parts, you know, and it was different in this regard because normally it was a thing where we just had a singer who was stuck on top of a record that had been done by David arranging and producing and me playing and programming. Mm. And then other people, you know, like guitars and whatever else. Whereas this was a case, there was a proper collaboration with the band where there was, um, they were playing parts of, you know, they were playing and so that it was different. And Jim had a very clear, you know, he was a, he's a, an, obviously intensely musical as they all are. Um, mm. But 
he he wanted to be in the studio he was you know so that the, i would say that what you're hearing is a collaborate in terms of the programming is very much i would i was extending what he to where he i was just going further down the road that he had mm. that traveled down rather than uh, we went punchier on that uh, than i i think the original he'd always gradually think and then then michael had a lot of fun with the guitars on that one you know that you know there is some really good things i think michael came up you know we would have programmed up and then michael came in and then we did some things where we, you know he did all those lovely little reverse bits and everything else it was um and then the vocals were done and uh it you know it felt great it was re it was really good you know i was very pleased with that one it's you know there's a reason it's the title track of, yeah of, you know, it's it's a beautiful track it really is yeah. um at what stage were the vocals done? Throughout, there wasn't a series. It wasn't one of those things where, where the vocals were done later. They they would be done as we were going on because also, it wasn't one of those things where David wanted to. So sort of, he didn't do the thing of going from different tracks all the time. We tended to focus on one song. Mm. That partly also was because of the fact that. Um, we were recording to tape and the mix had to be balanced up onto a desk and so on. We were using a Sony 3348 digital tape recorder. Cool. Um, but, you know, I had the Synclavier, was pro with the, I was programming it in the Synclavier and all the so on, but it's not like today. It's not that point where you can instantly switch from something. And the other thing is that by working one thing, you focused on that one thing and made it as good as it could be. Mm. Um, so it was, unusual to, to be having multiple things going on at the same time then it tended to be we would focus on one song and then focus on another song and so on michael says as much um when i interviewed him he was usually hired for three or six six hours at a time yeah uh, he'd come in and do one song possibly two on a day um, yeah. work on it and come back change it again and be focused on that one song at a time Yes. Yeah, incredible. sounds more like I took Jim's programming and just replaced the sounds. That sounds more like Jim's programming than mine. I would say on the drums. Um, that doesn't quite feel like me. It feels more like Jim. Um, and I would, then I would have added some pads and other keyboard stuff in the background. Um, and that was much more, that was of the sort of more euro feel you know what i mean that's that yeah. had the lighter more euro feel of it definitely a euro pop feel to that punchy yeah. punchy element to it yeah definitely. yeah um so were all the drums that's heaven knows were all those drums all synth based i want to say they were i can't specifically remember most of the album is synth based yeah it's it's, it's in clavier drums you know i know uh uh Simon Phillips may have played on some tracks, but I don't remember. Yeah, he played on two tracks specifically. Yeah. yeah, but I don't. But the vast majority with the Synclavier was me on the Synclavier. Wow, and it was a lot of the time copying those MIDI files, copying that track. Well, what would happen is, would they would give us a they they gave us a starting point, mm. and then we just went on further, and then we'd make a decision on whether I was going to replace them, redo them, um, and it may be just stylistically, I had a different way of. Yeah. of playing to to jim i've read some interviews with david regarding this track the track's called someday um yeah. two days before the album was going to be finished with the set of songs they were going to finish with that's what sharon says um before and then this song came along so it was a very last minute song
I know I can remember the groove. I can remember the the hook, the George Michael a da ba dum 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 groove. That was that. That's when that came in. We I think that was the thing I remember about it most was when that appeared. It may have been a track that we had worked on at some point. I mean, it, it sounds like, you know, you can see that there is very little difference between that and the finished article. It can be, you know, those are those things where you just go, well, this track, this album needs something that's a little bit more, you know, has a bit more of that particular spice. You know, there, there's a point when you're cooking, when you're cooking an album, it's whether it, there, there are all these different bits that take, you know, so that the album has that lovely flow. And, and there are only a number of times when a track can, you know, like this was, it had, a, it had a slightly rawer feeling than a lot of things. And I think I can see why it's in there. It, it makes sense that um, you talk about the recipe of the album. And if this was late in, in the stages, because it is actually the only track that David and the cause wrote together. That explains why it is. That's what's happened. It's one of the ones that have been done around the piano. It would have been one of the things that had been done around the piano and then we would have chucked it down as quickly as we could because we because everybody thought this is nice to have. I remember, I remember absolutely. Um, and that was one of those things where we often would record, the, the band would do that, not just the, the, obviously the vocals, but there was all the individual parts that, uh, that went into the, uh, so that this is what, you know, the thing that I sort of, I can remember Sharon was doing the violin and I remember being in, you know, that was the point where when she did the the violin, we were sitting in the back room, you know, it's like we sat there just while she recorded it. You know, it was fine. You know, I remember it all. It was, um, you can hear that's going to be a hit. Mm. Mm. It's a mm. beautiful bit. Beautiful thing. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. yeah. Andrea's recently um, published a memoir and she's done a couple of interviews regarding it. And she does touch on the creation of the album um, and how fearful she was to work initially with uh, David Foster and how intimidated she felt initially, not by him, but just being in that world all of a sudden from her hometown now suddenly miles away and then recording the album, the pressure's on. Um, she mentions that she had a lot of asthmatic bronchitis at certain points and that um, she thinks it was because of the anxiety uh, and that a lot of, not all of them, uh, especially not the main tracks on the album, she says, were recorded with just her and Jim on the vocal, um, just him recording them in the studio with her without David present. Do you have any insight on that at all? I don't mean the intimidation is the right word, but you, you expect people when they walk into the studio to give your A game, their A game. Yeah. Part of that was saying, you know, was effectively saying you're in the big leagues now. So step up. And um, we were used to the situation with sometimes big stars can get uh, complacent. And sometimes it's important to get them to, to understand they have to work that bit harder to make something great. Mm. Uh, that wasn't the case with the cause, but the, but that intensity of a studio, I can see why Andrew would say that yeah. because it was, um, we worked fast. I mean, very fast. Um, one of the reasons that, uh, I think David liked my programming was the, was I was quick. Yeah. Um, and we were used to doing things in a particular way, which, and we had a track record. And when I say we, I mean, it's like, the, yeah, there's everybody in this, but um, the, there was a track record that was hard to argue with. And therefore, when they were coming, you know, when the cause came in, we were probably at the peak of David's successes. You know, in terms of that, we mm. probably we'd just been a couple of years past the bodyguard. We're into the mid Celine period, um, and so on. I don't know if Tony Braxton was then or probably around then, and so on. Yeah, the um, Unbreak My Heart and so on. Mm -hmm. All of those things were happening, and so I can understand how 
a band from Ireland who have, you know, first of all, their first experience is to be shipped to New York uh, and be presented to David in the studio while we're working on Michael Jackson and then being told to, to that you're coming out to LA to record a, a, you know, the album and so on. I can see how that would be intimidating mm. and it's meant to be. I don't mean to be horrible, but the the job, you know, it, if you cut, it is one of those things where the pressure is important. Mm. It's part of what makes something work often in these cases. And they, they responded to it. You know, you listen to the record, I think it speaks for itself. It's that the process itself requires you to be at your peak at all times. You, 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 you know, okay. And I can see, especially for a singer, uh, in more so than I think any other thing, singing involves bearing your soul. Mm. And therefore it requires a, uh, a different set of, of, you know, when we, we can hide behind the instruments, um, whereas a singer can't. And therefore I can, the pressure on the singer is much, much, much more intense than that on of anybody else in the process. And um, I can see why Andrew would say that, but that is part of what makes, you know, hopefully gets the best out of things. One of the things that may be evident, I think, is there's an evolution in the album where the album starts more Celtic as we're recording it and then heads more into the rockier stuff. It gets, it, I think it gets tougher as, as it evolved. Obviously isn't reflected in the running order, but that in my mind and how often I've heard the, the album down the year, that makes perfect sense. And it's not something that had come to mind before, but it makes perfect sense. Um, and especially The Right Time, which is one of the earlier tracks that they, they were touring with when they were trying to get signed. Um, they were kind of sick of the song, but it is, it is it, melodically and especially how non-punchy it is, is very evident compared to the other, uh, some later tracks. It makes sense. a lot of that of uh, the uh, of the riff based songs where you have that you know like this there has the violin riff and so on um and then the, um i just get the feeling that things got that started getting sort of like um, punchier as we went along i may be wrong and i think this is more based around jim's initial programming as well uh, i mean uh, the, uh, so that's the other thing that when i'm listening to that that's what I'm hearing. You can hear more of Jim's flavor rather than your own. I'm not saying I, I, I'm, you know, it's like the, uh, uh, it just, there's a feeling about some of the drum fills and some of the, the, the way that it was, I mean, you know, they, they came, you know, Jim, they had a very good perception of how they wanted it to sound. Mm. Uh, I think, but anyway, yeah, no, I remember it. It's, it's, um, Again, that's that's on the lighter side of the record. Toss the feathers. Yeah. Um, incredible track, and obviously has live bass and by Neil, and then um, Simon Phillips on live drums, based on a traditional Irish tune. C can you shed any light on whether or not it was based on any other traditional version prior to that? No, I I just remember them playing it. It was a thing. It was, uh, and it gradually got faster. Literally, you know. I remember. <laughs> I remember. It just got faster and faster, and it, it and it had that whole. Uh, it had that whole, you know, that wild enthusiasm that was required, and I think if I, I seem to remember Simon might have. Where, where the drums done? Is it, I, I want to say that the other studio. Um, it was the other studio for the drums. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, but yes, uh, I think, uh, no, it's, it's great fun. I can't say any more. It was just, no, you know, no. the, yeah. Um, can you say any more regarding why 
live bass and drums were chosen for the track? I think the idea was to was that it it felt like a live it needed to feel live first of all, and secondly, I think Simon Phillips was available. That was the other thing: is if you have one of the world's great drummers available, mm. why not use it? And um, and I think it was also it it had that thing where you know because it has the, the uh, cello and um, and so on. It I think it was that thing where it, it was done almost live you know mm. the, 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 you know it was that sense of there needed to be uh, it was a it was a vibe song that could be done you know and i think that was the main thing simon worked on two tracks for the album um the other one didn't make the album um the other track was called i don't know mm-hmm. um and uh michael thompson had never heard it before it never got to the stage with michael thompson recording any guitar elements for it, um, which is strange how one set musician did, but it, for some reason it was dropped. It, it, I mean, it, it's more appropriate. It's more like an album or two later from a later album than it does from that first album. It's a lot rockier. It's a lot more American mm. country than yeah than, than Irish. I would say. Yeah, it was really you know, it was really strange talking to Simon about it because he was like he he wasn't aware he'd forgotten about the second song and he wasn't aware that it wasn't included on the, in the final album listing. And he, he said it was very strange to be brought, to be brought in um, to do a track, to be paid to do a track, and then the track just wasn't used. Mm-hmm. Um, but you think it's just a case of... It was wrong. Wrong for the album. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't feel like it, everything you, you know, listening back in the cold light of day, that doesn't feel like the same album. Mm. Mm. You're very right. And then there was a there was a counterpart thing that Andrea did against that. That was like a stack, and then there was a line that went against it. But I don't. I I, I listening to it, I can see exactly why it isn't on the record. No, and I and I, I'm your your triggering memories here. But, but I I have a general feeling of how I worked on the record, and more than the specific memories of it, I can room stacking. You know, they used to. You know, when, when initially there's a point where they, we were all like, they would cluster around the synclavia when we were building the track, because wow. suddenly this, 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 these songs that they'd had in a particular form were starting to evolve into a different thing, and that and that was uh, I think the so I remember very much that that process as we as we went along, um, and they got more confident as they went through. You know, ab- you know, it became much more of a you know something that uh they they felt comfortable with and we'd gone through and if if i remember rightly there was a point where initially rather than me going in for two days and then going and then going off and doing something else and then coming back for two days and so on i suspect that for that i get the feeling that if i'm rightly that i was there for a good chunk of the time just without moving my kit to other sessions i just was there for the album and I think that was the deal I did with David at the time was that I would agree to do like be there for a good chunk of time rather than just dipping in and out mm. um, so yeah the track I don't know there's obviously that um, synth guitar part who would have programmed that did that sound like your kind of stuff or David or I mean it could have been a, a synth a, it could have there was a there were these synth electric guitars which had a, where you had an electric guitar playing a synth sound, a synth guitar, not a synth guitar. <laughs> Sorry, to be sorry, not a keyboard being played with a synth with a guitar sound, but there were a, there were synthesized guitar synthesizers. Then that sounds like a guitar synthesizer to me. Sounds like a GR one of the Roland GR30s or something like that. Show me the way up. 
I have a feeling, I mean, that sounds more like Jim's drum. I think what often sometimes happens with Jim, we might take Jim's drum and bass drum and snare pattern, and then I would play a new hi hats and cymbals and stuff like that on some of them. That feels like that. This has an element of the Wendy and Lisa sound. If you listen, uh, if you listen, there's some, there was a, uh, Wendy and Lisa were two of Prince's band, and they had a big album around that time. And this, for some reason, reminds me a bit of that. I haven't, it has a bit of that uh, feel in terms of the way that we, we the clarity we try to get in the, in the, the sound, and in terms of the drum sound as well. Um, and you can feel, and this one feels more like there's that, if you take that there's like, there's this and the forgiven, not forgotten, the sort of the slightly tougher the edge of the album. Mm. This is, this is, this inhabits that world closer which is to me isn't very rocky and it's not very early cause either it seems to sit in the middle for me yeah this is one of those ones where i can feel my fingers doing the program it's there are times when you can feel i can feel i can feel uh i can i can feel the parts this we went i i remember doing a lot of keyboard programming on this. There's a lot of pads and lots of that thing. I think we went, this was more cinematic in some ways, you know, it had more scale than a lot of the other stuff. Huge, yeah. Um, and uh, um, no, it was one of those ones where it just got bigger and bigger. I used to do a lot of, you know, cause I did film, I still do, that's my job now. I used to, used to, used to composing films, but then, it was one of those things where this, this I think was a track um, that had the, where there was more room and that once you start with that, the, the rolling piano, then um, it, it was more, this was just, this had more scale. I don't, this is one of those things because I don't think we did any re, I don't think we did live strings at all on this album. No, I think it's all Synclavia. This was a quite a core. There was a small team that made the record. Mm, yeah, yeah. You know, with the exception of Neil and Simon on, on the, effectively on one track, which is yeah, a, yeah. into the rest of it. I think it was just David, Michael, and me and Jim, and then obviously you know, and and uh, Andrew and Caroline and Sharon. Mm. You know, it wasn't uh, in terms, but in terms of the core session musicians i think it was just david and michael and me and obviously and, and what jim had brought in i don't know i'm trying to work out whether that was a live piano there's live piano obviously later on but i can't remember whether i whether the whether the rotating figure was live or not i can't remember Watching every day my smile could warm your friend and I'd never look away, never. There's more to me than what you see. No, I can I can feel my fingers going into the rhythm, so it was one of those things I, I remember. And and, I, and it is I like that one a lot. I think it's really good. It's 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 it's, it's, it's just it, it was the, the there are points where I can I can feel the, uh, the what was going on. It, it's uh, that's twenty five years. That's it is twenty five years, and and um, which I which is staggering. Um, you know anyway it's a lifetime ago indeed oh, beautiful beautiful
non-album tracks. The only other one that was released and that's credited under any BMI listings or anything is Rainy Day, which came as a B-side to the Love to Love You single. The original, uh, one of the demo tapes before the instrumentals were mixed in, has this on the album lineup already as one of the main tracks of the album and not a B-side or anything like that, as if it was originally on the album and then was taken out. I know often we did, it was quite common to record songs that you knew you were going to need B-sides. And you, so the B-side, and they often, they performed a different thing to, uh, you know, to album tracks. Mm. An album track could be a more expansive thing. Could You could allow more space in an album track that, that allow you to express yourself more musically in terms of doing different things. Whereas B-sides tended to be the sort of like more, the, the quirky or the lighter or the, you know, the, the, the more throwaway stuff that were there to give fans something that they didn't get from the record because from the album, because you didn't, well, there's no point to, if you buy, if you took out a single, if you had a B side that was on the album, there is no point for somebody buying a single. Yeah. The B side makes a fan buy a single because it is a track that doesn't exist anywhere else. The only other track from that I believe from those recording sessions that exists is, it's a song called Somebody Else's Boyfriend, which came as the bonus track on the Japanese only version of the album. Maybe and it's tearing me apart. I tried my best to charm into letting her go loose, but it keeps me from treating with another good excuse. Though I'd hate it done to me, Would it, would it have been the case that, oh, we need a Japanese market track, let's do another track for the, for the album just for that? Would it have been focused that way? There, there was always a bonus track on the Japanese-only version because the Japanese had a thing. It was really expensive to buy records in Japan at the time. And what you the Japanese record, record company, was the Japanese uh, music business was huge. Japanese spent a fortune on records then and because it was so expensive it was common for them to buy their record and then ship it to Japan to save on the cost of the local album it might be cheaper for them to buy it elsewhere so you had to do a Japanese version so that people would buy the Japanese the Japanese would buy the Japanese record so there was always a, an additional track for Japan to allow to, to keep the Japanese fans buying the Japanese version. When you're going through things and you stack them up and you work out these ones are feeling good or this feeling, you know, there, there will be tracks that deserve more attention and tracks that deserved less. Mm. Um, and also it, it, the other thing is that there were tracks that, for instance, individual members of the band might have more, have a wish for certain, things to be there yeah um you know so that it might be that and i'm not saying this is the case i'm just saying that one of the band may have loved this song or one of the band may have loved one of the other songs and so we did it because that was one of their favorites yeah you know particularly it might be that although um you know when when they were writing you know it could be that the songs are more of one of the member of the songs of the band than the other and therefore that gives them a more of a, a an affinity to that and wanting to see that yeah. end up somewhere and that is quite you know everybody's you know you you uh, you want um you're proud of you know you you want your children to see the light of day the the period of time you spent on it i've got some people saying it was four to six months other people saying it's a solid six months other people saying it's up to eight months to create the record i don't think it's eight months i think four to six is i think there was a chunk at the beginning there were like i got the feeling that there were 
tranches of time mm -hmm. because we had that you know and that were the, i don't know that they were in malibu for six months i think they may have gone home you know i think um or and then come back uh eight months doesn't seem that seems too long for this long time yeah yeah and also there was a lot of things where, where for instance we went i know we went back and looked at some of the things where for instance um there may be times when there was a sound that jim had made that i then then we looked back and said could we make that better or it could be a sound that uh it could be a guitar part that initially had been a Jim guitar part that became a Michael guitar part, um, yeah. or it could have been a, a piano that was uh, maybe a Caroline piano became a David piano, um, or you know those sorts of things. There were there were those variations where um, where as the refinements went along, um, things you know things were improved. You know improved. Um, it doesn't. I don't remember this being a long, long album. I mean, no. you know, I, and I wasn't obviously, I was dipping in and out of it in comparison to the band. Um, but it doesn't feel like it was that, you know, if you told me it was 12 weeks, I would have not been surprised. Cool. Um, um, so six months, yeah, I can imagine four to six months. I can't imagine longer. One of the restrictions would have been actually David's time. This was the big thing for him and for Lava. This was going to be the. This was going to be the. David really wanted one four three to be a huge hit, and this was sort of a collaboration. Therefore, he was willing to. That was what the difference was. His, most of the time, he was producing for other people, whereas this was one of these things where he was producing effectively for himself as well. It was a happy album, I think. After the initial nerves, my impression was that it was, you know, it was an enjoyable process and it was different to everything, you know, it was different to what we were used to doing. And it was different from, you know, uh, different from, uh, you know, for them, it was obviously a new experience, but for us, I think as well, you know, there was just something that I really, you know, I think that whole infusion of Celtic rhythms and so on. Um, river dance became a thing. It suddenly went from being, you know, an interlude at the Eurovision Song Contest. And I hadn't seen it, I don't think it was because I was based in LA full time then. So, you know, the, the, that period of British music and, and the Eurovision Song Contest is so sort of, the first time I heard it, it was when it, it was something that we suddenly, everybody got into river dance. It became this big thing. And then I think out of that, I want to say that there was there was a attempt at a working relationship between Bill and if not David with some of the people in Celine's camp. And then from that uh i can imagine that from that came the cause i think you know there was not not because of anything else but 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 there was this the that irish vibe mm. was in there and i think it was something that david suddenly felt like this is something that we could that he really wanted to have uh you know have a go at and um making a pop record that had that river dance vibe which is interesting because bill is responsible for production on a lot of the early demos before they got signed mm -hmm. um, and especially uh two tracks that never came to the, to the actual album he did orchestral versions for them as well so it's yeah. interesting how that's come came full circle and david got his wish as well which is yes yeah, that's good it's very interesting very, very interesting. But the music turns wild, no sweetness to bring. But silence to blackbirds near of the spring. The silence forsakes them, sad music retakes them. Our dreams are rich, a bright new dawn. 
thing was, it was an album where they, because they were there, there was always the family, you know, it wasn't just the, the there was a family situation there because of the, the mum and dad being there. Um, but also there were, yeah, there was competition between the, the members of the band, mm. between the family members. Um, you always got the feeling that there was that, that sibling rivalry in a good way. They kept it, that's, I think they made, kept their performances, they kept them fresh because they would work, you know, there was a point when um, they were doing their sort of, in, their overdubs, because there would be the penny whistle, the violin, mm. piano, whatever, it's all the individual, the drums and sometimes overdubs and whatever else, all the guitars, all of those were done you know, we were doing it as we were going through the process. It wasn't something that they got done at the end. They were very much in the mix because we would often, you know, let's try this, let's see how that goes and so on. Um, uh, I don't want to say it's a pressure cooker because it wasn't a pressure cooker, but it was a sense of because there was a focus that came by having them that way, that, that everybody just was aiming in on the same place. Um, you know, it was almost like being in a residential studio. Um, what used to happen in the in the old days, we used to often go off to a studio in the countryside, you know, like I would go and take an artist off to produce them, you know, that, because they would get out of London, so they or get out of uh, LA, or we'd go to Compass Point to the Bahamas and do vocals and whatever else. All those things used to happen because getting away from the smoke gave people a time that they could focus in on these things. And I think there was an element of that in Forgiven Not Forgotten in that it uh, had a, a collaborative process that happened not just with us as the musicians but also as them within the band as well. I mean, the other thing is that John Hughes was crucial throughout that process. I think I think people shouldn't underestimate um, what a class act he, he uh, is. Thank you for spending some time. It's been You're very welcome. wonderful. It's been really informative, very uh, enriching the, the whole experience of listening to the album back, hearing those things you said, it's going to be, be wonderful. It really paints a larger picture of the album. What more can I say? Thank you so much. Okay. It's been okay. wonderful. See you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon. Okay. Bye-bye. A huge thank you goes out to Simon for forgiving of his time so freely. And what an incredible insight. It was amazing to hear of his experience, his clear memories of working with the band on their first album. I've been reached out to by a number of fans to request transcripts in their own language of the show to help with translation. If you require a transcript of the show, please just to reach out and ask. I do have digital transcripts available and you're more than welcome to have them for free to aid in any way possible. If you have any questions regarding the season so far or this episode specifically, feel free to reach out to me. The easiest way of contacting me would be via Instagram, that's at CauseCast. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider liking, sharing and subscribing. Please leave a review if you have the time, as this will really help others find the podcast in the future. Thank you again for listening. If you haven't listened to previous episodes, I implore you to go back and listen to episode one and two of the season. You've been listening to CauseCast. <laughs>